So today uh, is our second week of CMC's countdown to the 75th anniversary of the college. July 1, we officially turned 75 years old. Hopefully you've gotten some of the uh, recent uh, postcards and emails. You visited the countdown website, countdown.cmc.edu to see uh, some of our historical documents in our archives and uh, some, few, uh, some ways to get involved. During that 75 day countdown, uh, across all of our social media platforms, if you don't follow us on Instagram or Facebook, please do so. We're recording a special moment in the history of the college. So for each day, it represents a year in the college's founding. And we find things that are important, uh, of course, whether it's people or programs, buildings uh, to highlight. And on Sunday, it represented 1954 which was the day the management, the, the year the management engineering program started at CMC. So today we're very excited to welcome the current program director, Professor of Physics, Scott Gould, and he will introduce some other members uh, of our uh, student alumni and faculty community who will be joining us as well. Uh, with that, I will leave uh, the remainder of the program to Professor Gould, who will outline a little bit about the program uh, and uh, a great discussion on, uh, on, uh, on all things M-E-N-E-E. -N -E -E. Professor Gould, thanks to you and your team for joining us today, and the program is yours. I will be following questions in the chat, and I'll bring them up as appropriate. Uh, greetings, folks. Um, actually, this is really kind of neat. I'm seeing names go by, uh, many names who had to suffer through my Physics 35 class. Um, also, have, we're fortunate that uh, Professor James Higdon, who ran the program for 25 years, has been able to join us. And I'm sure there are many, uh, I've already seen a few names that I know have probably worked with Professor Higdon. We're also uh, uh, fortunate to have a several students who are in the current program right now. Oh my gosh, there's another name that I certainly know well. Um, uh, Josh Guggenheim, who's actually calling from Taiwan from uh, his company after he finished his work uh, at Columbia, and he can talk about his experiences. Uh, Tara Rendujantala, did I do it right? <laughs> yeah, she's always she's always just Tara, um, <laughs> who's currently now um, in her master's program at Wash U in St. Louis. Matias Alvarado, who is a uh, just got accepted to Columbia and is about to go through the whole process, uh, transfer process. What I thought we should do is to give you an idea of what it the program's like now. There have been some changes, and I'm always interested in hearing your experiences and why you what you see is different, what you thought was good about your program that we can continue to incorporate or hope are still incorporating into the program now. Um, so that's what I figure we'll start with. And we'll talk a little bit with the students. And of course, Professor Higdon will give you a whole bunch of history about um, his, his knowledge on it. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope this works again. And uh, hopefully you can see this on the right hand side and it should say economics and engineering. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to make this a little bit larger. So it turns out, um, actually, under Professor Higdon's tutelage, um, a second major for 3.2 was created called Economics and en Engineering to differ from the Management Engineering. And uh, he can talk more about what that was. Uh, but right now, uh, we've decided that uh, in the last few years to actually unify them back. And uh, because most students were now selecting the name economics and engineering, and because there wasn't a, the sort of management uh, work that I heard about in the 60s is sort of was gone, um, this is a more descriptive title for the major. So again, any student who does 3-2, they have to go through this major, which of course celebrates that which CMC does very, very well, which is economics. Okay. All right. So let me see if I can get this started. Um, again, a reminder that the key here is we are still enhancing their engineering experiences with things involved in economics, microeconomics, econometrics, uh, things like that. It is still a liberal arts experience. Okay? They are still taking philosophy and psychology, et cetera. Um, the key is, of course, they provide a solid foundation in mathematics and some of the natural sciences. Okay. And then true, it, for most of the students who transfer now, they end up going to an engineering school for which they specialize in a type of engineering. We still have a, a relationship with Harvey Mudd, so there, if they go there, they get a 
general engineering degree, sort of in systems engineering. But most students actually specialize in a field of engineering. Although, as Josh might actually talk about the fact that his own experiences, even what two, three years out of uh, finishing at Columbia, he has been through a spectrum of different types of engineering, even though he was labeled the mechanical engineer, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, very good. So the key is it still comes out to you get the BA from CMC and the BS from the school that, um, that you go to. A large portion of the students these days are now staying on for an extra year, or actually in Tara's case, all she needed is a half year to add a master's degree. And um, most of uh, all the schools that we have a relationship with generally have this option, again, except of Harvey Mudd because they don't have a graduate school. Um, and this is becoming very, very popular. Uh, a reminder, of course, the key is that when you do, for a lot of the students who are coming in now, um, they, they're choosing CMC, they're choosing this program because they're not quite sure if they're ready for engineering school, but they like both the combination of STEM and economics. In fact, the E in STEM might be at STEAM, S-T-E-E-M. Um, and so we certainly continue to provide that type of background, um, a fair amount of physics, three semesters or four semesters of physics. And of course, the big advantage is we do have Harvey Mudd next door. And so a number of students have go over and take that first engineering course there to see whether this is something that is useful to them. Um, so before they make the big jump to another institution. And as I said, uh, we do highlight to make sure that the students are aware that when they transfer, they often transfer into a type of major, depending upon the school, they can either, they're either sort of locked into a type of major, or sometimes they can float around at some of the other schools uh, other than Columbia. Columbia tends to be very sort of rigid, but on the other hand, if you again choose a very open major, such as mechanical engineering, you end up doing a lot of different types of engineering as it is. Um, so again, lots of options for the students. In fact, I think I did a calculation and I realized given all the different types of programs we have and the different schools and the different majors, I have to advise for 137 possible combinations. Fortunately, it's, it's, I've tried to simplify it a bit. Okay, a reminder, actually, we do have articulation agreements with several schools. No, one of them is not Stanford. I believe that ended in the early 80s Jim might be well, actually early 90s but yeah. early 90s yeah um yeah but we still have an uh, relationship with Columbia that's probably the most popular uh USC is also quite popular particularly in computer engineering uh Washington University in St. Louis which is different than University of Washington in Washington although I mentioned that uh, and then Harvey Mudd and so what the key is of course students should they want to go through this program or when they're ready to transfer, most of them are prepared for virtually all the different types of uh, engineering schools that they can get themselves into. And it is true, we've also had students who've been applied and have accepted to other engineering schools as well, including I know recently Cornell. And I believe actually in the 70s and maybe in the 60s, Cornell was popular. And I think somebody mentioned Rice. Uh, uh, I was just talking to Professor uh, uh, Steve Naftalin, and he said when he was doing it even before Jim, um, Rice was also popular. But we don't have any students who go to Rice now. Um, I should finally mention uh, University of Washington. A lot of the students these days are coming from the Seattle area, and they would like to return back to Washington. And I went up um, actually like a few days before the pandemic really hit. Uh, yes, I was near Kirkland, Washington, and um, and I was coughing on the way home on the plane. Um, and I sent an email to the director of, uh, sorry, the Dean of Engineering School at University of Washington, it's a very good engineering school. And I said, would you be interested in meeting with me and talking about a 3-2? And they said, they have no 3-2 program. And they said, but come on up, let's talk. So I flew up and I, I saw them and uh, they said, look, we don't have a program, but we know CMC. We know it's a great school. Send your students as fast as possible. So thanks to you folks, actually CMC has a very good reputation and um, it was very easy. And so uh, the hope is maybe that will be a articulation agreement. At least the first thing is we have a good relationship with that type of school. And then again, that's attributed to your work. 
So with that, that is basically the program. I'm, I can go into more detail, but I think at this point, what I'd like to do is actually start with Diaz, who right now can sort of talk about his experience of sort of going through at CMC in his preparation for his type, type of major. So if you could talk about what you see yourself going to and why you chose this 3-2 option with Diaz. Yeah, hi there. So again, yeah, my name is Matias I'm from the Bay Area. And uh, as Professor Bull uh, noted, I am a junior, so I'll be leaving uh, CMC this semester, heading over to Columbia to pursue uh, operations research, which is in their uh, school of IOR, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research. And uh, for me, from the beginning, I was always uh, very business oriented, um, but I, I wanted to approach it uh, with, from a few different elements, right? With a few different elements. Um, I wanted to understand the, you know, a technical approach uh, to problem solving um, and, and you know, doing that in order to communicate effectively uh, with engineers um, and I also wanted to leave my options open in the sense of um, applying my skills to, to a variety of projects. So um, the reason I, I selected uh, OR, Operations Research, is because what it really uh, is about is, is, you know, using mathematical models to kind of optimize processes and break problems down into little pieces and solving them that way. And um, what CMC has helped me with in doing that and in preparing for that is that I've been exposed to really a variety of subjects that um, allow me to think about problems in different ways. Now, uh, that you know, obviously we have a we have the physics and the computer science aspect, which are the more technical aspects. Um, and so I've done those in addition to really taking the breadth of courses in mathematics and in computer science as well. Uh, in addition to the social sciences uh, and humanities requirements, and so um, that's really allowed me to really approach. Um, approach, uh, you know, problem solving from a variety of aspects. And I think it's, it's prepared me really quite well uh, to, to engage in these problems. So, so uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to continue the next journey. And uh, I've, been, I've been excited to Columbia, as Professor Gould uh, mentioned, and I'm, I'm really excited to uh, head on over there in the fall. Thank you, Matthias. Um, yes, actually, the program that he has gotten accepted to is still considered one of the most demanding uh, for the Columbia applicants. So I, I applaud him for all the efforts and the many semesters of doing overloads in order to be prepared for it. Uh, Tara, why don't you talk about your experiences and um, how that translated in what happened when you showed up at WashU? Yeah, so um, I took a lot of, well, first of all, I joined CMC into the program, but it was one of those things where you could always leave if you didn't want to finish it. Um, but through all the math, physics, and uh, CS classes that I took, I realized I really actually do love engineering. Um, the liberal, liberal arts portion of it really gave me a overview into generally things that I would have missed otherwise. Definitely, I was able to take classes that I wouldn't have been able to take anywhere else. Um, I then carry that over to WashU and I still take econ classes. Um, I'm doing research kind of straddling both dimensions um, in engineering and economics. Um, and yeah, so I, all my internships have been in the engineering space, but I tend to always have the ability to um, use my econ and business aptitude that I learned or gained at CMC. Um, and at WashU, I was able to decide whether or not I wanted to stay in computer engineering because I did like low level languages and kind of that interaction. And I had the ability to take classes across all engineering domains. So I've taken quite a few electrical engineering classes as well as computer science. So I really do get the breadth of that whole tech stack. Um, so yeah, I, I think this program in general has given me, I think everything that college could offer a student um, in all ways, shapes and forms. All right, very good. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we should hear from someone who just recently graduated. And I was just curious as to whether anything you got from CMC actually was useful in terms of your experiences at Columbia and your experiences at uh, your new uh, uh, position. In fact, why don't you tell us a little bit what, what you're doing now? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, these days I'm working for a company called Spin. It's a Ford's micro mobility electric scooter division um, doing manufacturing test engineering. And yeah, I think that there's there's so much from CMC that um, has carried over to the Columbia experience and to the engineering in general. I think the biggest one is just communication, um, communication of ideas. I think I uh, just, you know, I, there's so many cool things being developed at any given company. Um, but I think that the ability to to translate the work that you're doing and make sure everybody's on the same page and make sure everybody understands the motivation for that work and why it's impactful uh, carries a lot of value and weight. And I think that just through the different courses at CMC, through the different um, uh, organizations I was involved with, you really learn how to take um, take complicated ideas, take ideas you were you know, recently introduced to understand them at a deep level and be able to communicate those to people who are familiar with it, unfamiliar with it, and really uh, um, make sure everybody's on the same page and understands where you're coming from and where you're trying to go. Um, yeah, I see that all, all the time in the work that I'm doing, and I think that uh, it helps me to be a better engineer. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Finally, I would like to ask Professor Higdon about his, the history, because there has been some modifications. What have you uh, seen that has been the biggest change, uh, or what it, and what sort of things, what threads have ma been maintained in the program since you took over? back in, I think it was 1992. The, uh, the main thing that I did at the time was uh, the, uh, we had the two tracks and uh, basically uh, economics and engineering back then was, um, CMC would give you a degree in uh, a, a, B, a BA in economics. And then some of the students were uh, asking me back then about whether they should do that or not, or could I do it? And I said, no chance. And I went to the administration, they said, sure. But it had, you had this issue of having a, a different, uh, basically the big difference was the, the E and E track took uh, quite a bit more um, uh, economic courses and some people could do it and some couldn't. And so that uh, got some interesting number. We, we spent a lot of time trying to cut and paste courses on the fly with individuals and it got a little out of hand the last year I was doing it. So I thought it was interesting. Some of you faces look, uh, you look very familiar. One or two of you have an age to bet. Uh, uh, but yes, um, it was an interesting experience for me to advise students. And so many of you ended up on Wall Street in the past. So uh, uh, interesting. So you've, you've integrated it. I think it might be streamlined and it might be a better approach. Does that help, Scott? Absolutely. Fantastic. So, okay. So we've given our sort of little dog and pony show or essentially a description of where it is today. Um, so what we, I guess we want to open it up for questions or uh, hear from your experiences and, uh, you know, go ahead and ask and we'll hopefully uh, we, have we have answers and we, we've, is that right, Evan? We have Does a lot work? of questions that have come in, which is great. Oh boy. Um, All right. So should we I... just answer directly? We get, I, I've been collecting them, so I'm, I'm happy to ask them of, of the group. Uh, uh, just so everyone knows, I did put, um, we had, I think Lisa is on, Lisa pulled some numbers for us. Uh, about 450 alumni we're tracking who were three, two majors. Um, and uh, I put in there also the largest employers in the chat and the most popular um, professions. So executive management, engineering, and so on. So just some, some fun facts there. I think we were all... Uh, we were all thinking about. So we had, we had um, a few people talk about numbers. They're very curious, the number of students who are graduating uh, uh, ME now versus then, and also uh, the number of women enrolled. Recognize, of course, we were a men's college at one point, and then when we went co-ed, the, the women cohorts were smaller, but now we're about 50-50. So what are we seeing with the gender balance as well? It's still predominantly men, but I would say about a third now are uh, women. Uh, so again, it changes from year to year. Um, I didn't do that quickly, the calculation, but basically it's that's about it. I, I fill out a number of applications, uh, letters, write letters for uh, women applicants, um, but it's still, it's not quite 50-50 and I don't anticipate it being 50-50. It just tends to be, uh, I, we have more students who come in and show interest in it tend to be men and therefore it's not surprising the in the end we end up with more men uh, eventually uh, leaving. Um, I should should say one other number is, is about half the people who sort of start the path 
since I've taken over, I, Jim, I have a different experience, uh, end up actually uh, applying for transfer. And even then, not everybody who gets offered a, a shot to transfer, and I should tell you, well over 99, well, not 99%, but 95% of, of those who apply to transfer are accepted at one of these uh, schools. Um, a lot of them, we still got students who say, and I think Tara mentioned once, it's hard to leave the happiest college in the country. I think Josh said that a couple weeks ago, but I wholeheartedly agree. I always say that leaving CMC was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. I think, uh, you know, engineering school is not easy by any means, but the hardest part was certainly uh, leaving the community and friends and everything at uh, CMC for sure. You guys are, are not alone. Uh, I'm reading all the class notes that were submitted for our special edition, and there are a lot of MEs who, who talk about that and talk about that difficulty, and in some cases went to Harvey Mudd because of it, in some cases just had three great years at CMC and then moved on. Um, the question about, um, about the connection with Cornell. Uh, there used to be a connection with Cornell, doesn't seem to be around anymore. Uh, maybe, you know, Scott or Jim, either one, maybe talk a little bit about our, our former Cornell connection and where that went. Jim, I'm going to leave this one to you. Uh, yeah, the, by the time uh, the early 90s turned around, we didn't get a lot of interest in Cornell. And uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of it was weather, a lot of it was location. Uh, I, I tried to push people that way, but it, uh, it uh, didn't carry um, some of them. Uh, now it might be a little more interesting, but it was, it was a tough sell. I certainly mention it, and I should also say that I do know of at least uh, one, uh, two students who were accepted to Cornell. Um, I don't think either one chose to go there. One, again, decided that she was happier at CMC um, and that she decided to go to graduate school directly out of CMC. Next question. Um, and a similar question about Stanford. Why, why was it that Stanford terminated the program? That was such a popular place for our alumni from the 50s, 60s, and 70s to go. Any more intel on that? Well, that Chip, happened. Chip. Uh, let me try that, Scott. That was way, way in the early 90s. Uh, what happened was the obvious thing that Stanford could fill their program with their, uh, their, uh, their local home students, and they felt they, um, uh, they weren't interested in having these transfer uh, programs with a variety of schools. And uh, it was cut at a very high president to president level. John, you, my friend, you, my Stark was uh, certainly pushed for it. Uh, he talked to their president and it was way above, uh, uh, I was transiting into running it. it, it they, they tried, but the CMC tried, to, they certainly put a push and uh, Stanford just said no. And I can also say, I was actually talking to Professor Naftalin about it when he said it sort of came through with, with him and they basically the admissions people said it's, it was straightforward in that at this point, Stanford was really taking off and they were getting a you know gigantic packet of students who got 1600s on their SATs and straight A's completely. And um, they felt that, that that pool was sufficiently strong enough that they did not need the feeder system um, that uh, others uh, that they had been using. It happens. Uh, so we have a question from um, from Mike Tamas. The program described online is economics engineering. Could another discipline, a social science like psychology, be paired with the engineering prerequisites? Uh, could that be pursued if economics is not as much an interest? Is there a way to kind of modify the program? Uh, Jim, I'm going to let you start with this one, and then I'll. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I certainly ran into that one many a time. The, the, uh, the issue is uh, what one could do, of course, would be do, um, uh, do the courses for uh, the requirement for one major. And, uh, but uh, it would seem this was raised. This was, I certainly, a couple, at least twice, I raised it seriously with the CMC administration about having such a variant and uh, that was not well received. And um, the idea, basically the idea would you do a direct transfer and you get a degree from the second school. They did not wanna pursue 
an intermix of uh, other majors and uh, engineering or whatever. It, it yeah. did not fly. So I can tell you what has happened more recently is, um, yeah, it, it, it is a feeling that CMC's strength is in their economics, and this is part of the being unique of, of the CMC major. And it is true if you go through 3-2 in other schools that you could be a physics major or a philosophy major. And as long as you prepared enough to do the transfer, uh, the other school, the engineering schools would accept you. But that's just not the CMC way. And be just be aware of it when you come to CMC if you're applying to CMC. Uh, the other option, and, and I do advise students to be aware of this, is that you can finish at CMC in a quantitative discipline, say math, physics, economics, as long as you've had enough physics and math and stuff, and then go directly to graduate school um, in engineering. Um, there are a few engineering disciplines that uh, that would be very difficult, but most engineering disciplines these days will accept it. And about a third of the physics majors now actually do that path. They end up going directly for a PhD or MA, uh, MS in engineering after they finish um, the four years at the schools. So that's how they can continue to do, they could do physics and philosophy and then still go to engineering school. But the advantage with the 3-2 is you get to do the engineering sooner. Perfect, thank you. Um, a two-part question, part one from Don Waddell is what opportunities do current 3-2 students have to interact with past graduates of the program? Back in his day, the program leaders arranged for regular Q&A sessions with alumni and students. So that's the first part is, you know, how, how can students, how are students and alumni interacting and so on and so forth, or even current three-year students interacting with current two-year students. Part two, some of you will ask, how can they help? How can they be more involved? Pause there. Um, yeah, so certainly if you want, if you are willing to make a presentation, interact with students. Um, I'm willing to set things up. We've, we've, I've talked to a couple of you um, who may be here for that type of interaction. Um, some of you I know, I have reached out when you were at the other schools to make sure that you play. In fact, Tara, for example, plays sort of the mentor role if students are interested in going to watch you. Um, but beyond that, what goes beyond in 10 years, 15 years from now, I don't know. I, can't, I think I've seen a couple of you folks when I've gone back for a reunion. I'm standing out there, you know, willing to talk. Um, so I think the best program is actually go through Evan's uh, department. Um, because uh, you know, we're, we're not set up, and unfortunately this pandemic kind of caused some problems here. Uh, we're not really set up to do that type of thing, but I don't see any reason why the worst comes to you is just reach out to me. I can send you my email and uh, we'll see if we can arrange for something. Uh, we did have a conversation with, uh, I know at least one of uh, you um, this, this past year on, and I advertise it to all the uh, engineering students and not just CMC students. I, you know, Jim and I have served for Scripps students and Pitzer students. And um, so far, uh, the, uh, you're welcome. So reach out to me and I'll just put it in the chat. Thanks, Scott. And we do have a yearly program in New York City since Columbia is one of our, our popular um, uh, programs. So we have a, a hosted dinner with uh, Professor Gould and current students and program alumni. We also have something on Alumni Weekend, uh, which started just a couple of years ago. So I hope you come back uh, frequently and often and, and enjoy that. Uh, finally, we have a new uh, online platform where students and alumni can gather and connect. And uh, that is being in a, in a soft launch now, uh, engage.cmc.edu, where um, you can offer to help. So you can, as, a, as an ME major, you can offer to help students during the um, process of registering. So uh, next question um, we have uh, here. Uh, oh, for the for our, our students and young alumni, what was the what is the most difficult part of the program today? Uh, I'm gonna let Josh start it and then actually I'd be interested in hearing from somebody else who other than uh, the three that I brought. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of different uh, challenges associated with the program. I think um, kind of transferring in general is, is always a challenge. Uh, starting, starting as a new student, um, kind of in a third year, you're kind of a junior, but you're a freshman. So that's always interesting. Um, I think the, the co context switch between 
uh, being in like studying liberal arts uh, course material and um, taking that approach and that perspective and the way the classes are taught and structured um, is challenging. Switching to the to engineering where you know the the content is is drastically different than than what you've been doing the last few years and the the way courses are taught and evaluated. Um, I think one of the the biggest challenges is uh, I mean everybody's everybody's courses and, and institutions teach differently, but. Um, you, you really start to appreciate uh, even more so than before the, the way you can engage with your CMC professors, the, the uh, other the peers in your classes, the communities that are built at CMC, um, and, and the amount of time and uh, the, the care that professors provide at CMC, um, maybe compared to other, other opportunities in other schools, you really can build these relationships at CMC. Um, so, so kind of figuring out how to approach learning in a new way, um, how to uh, navigate the yeah, the different academic course loads and, and topics and stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of different challenges, but also just a lot of uh, new, new fun aspects to the learning as well that um, just aren't uh, you know, necessarily available at a liberal arts school. You get a, a full robust um, machine shop and, and a lot of different opportunities to build and break things. So a lot, a lot of fun parts that come with the challenges as well. And I'm going to call out Patrick Hennessy did he hear him? Yes, he just heard himself. And since he is also recently graduated, and if he's willing to share his experiences and what he's doing now, I'd be interested. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I recently completed 3.2, uh, finished up at CMC 2018, actually did a philosophy major alongside the management engineering major, which was super fun, a lot of overloading required as well, um, before jumping over to USC, just an hour away, where I studied uh, computer and electrical engineering which was a mix of CS and electrical. Um, I'm currently working at Google, uh, full, working fully remote for, for this whole job since I started, which is definitely strange to start a job during this pandemic, but very excited to get in the office soon. I'll be working at a Mountain View, but for now living in Denver, uh, trying to ski as much as possible before all the snow melts. But yeah, really love my time at 3.2 and I don't think I would have gotten the job I have now without that last two years in engineering. So very grateful. And I'm going to call out one other thing. I think saw Cassie Davies. Um, and Cassie, do you remember? Can you tell us what you're doing now and what was your biggest challenge in uh, transferring and doing the whole process? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassie. I finished up, well, I came in as the class of 2017, left CNC in 2016. Then I transferred to Wash U, and I was actually one of those students that stayed an extra year and got, got a master's. So yay for the few washy folks I see on the, on the call. Um, I think the biggest change is definitely the transfer. I think what Josh hit on was a lot of what, what resonated with me, but it gave a whole new opportunity to live in a whole new place and really have opportunity to have two different college experiences. So I think that was a huge plus, but also comes with a lot of growing pains and new learnings and just life. So I think that was probably what resonated with me. Um, I'm currently a quality engineer now at Abbott Vascular in Temecula, California. So went out to the Midwest, <laughs> came back, back to Southern California. But yeah, so now uh, working in the medical device space, um, I studied biomedical engineering and I had a minor in electrical. So similar to, to Patrick, like EE seems to be a, a helpful thing in a lot of different jobs nowadays. Right. Evan, you want to try another? I, I think we've, we've. Yeah. Uh, so one. someone, someone in the chat's curious why Harvey Mudd isn't more popular. Why do we think that most of our students go leave the Claremont colleges as opposed to going to Harvey Mudd? Uh, the, the probably most straightforward answer and, and Jim, you're, you can talk more about it is, um, it is, is quite challenging. Uh, the number of courses required, uh, by Harvey Mudd in order to do the transfer there is substantially more than the other schools. So for example, uh, because you're at Har near Harvey Mudd, they expect you to have finished at least five engineering courses before you even do the transfer. Plus you have to do all their GEs, which means a, uh, again, a year of chemistry as opposed to a semester of chemistry, because very few of our students actually do chemical engineering, um, a semester of biology. Um, and as I said, and five engineering courses, which is not something that any of the other schools, engineering schools expect you to be able to do. So that, that's probably it. 
there may be ethos, there may be a philosophy, you may not want to, you may, you know, it just may not attract the type of students, but that, that would be the, my easy, the easiest answer to give. Jim, did you have a thought on that? Um, well, there were two things uh, over the years. I, I, I tried quite a bit to connect up with MUD and that uh, was part of the reason behind the uh, economics and engineering. Two things, one, there are a number of students who wanted to get out of Claremont. That was one thing. And the other one was MUD offers a general degree and a number of our students were very specific. They wanted a mechanical or electrical and they felt that I think correctly, MUD wasn't able to give them that that base. So between those two, it is, it's in, and I think Scott is right, the, the work needed ahead of time is tough. That's great information. Thank you both. Um, we had a couple of questions about the application process today for that transfer. Uh, can you describe that process and if there's any required GPAs nowadays for admission or for transfer admission? Uh, Taro, uh, why don't you, oh, actually, no, Matthias, why don't you talk about it since you're the most recent person who applied? Right. I mean, you know, I, I applied completely online. That was one thing that was, that was, uh, different here from the pandemic, but it, you know, Columbia, Columbia has their own application for other schools. You can apply through the common app, uh, in the, for the transfer. Um, and, uh, for, for most, it's actually pretty standard. They're looking for your courses, some letters of rec, um, uh, uh, letters from the liaison, Professor Gould for Columbia. Uh, and then we are, uh, we've been hearing back beginning uh, early April, and we've just been you know, waiting for decisions uh, on a rolling basis. And Tara, did you apply to more than one school? Yeah, I actually applied to a bunch of UCs because I live in uh, the Bay Area and I got into a couple. I think the issue there was less so, um, well, first of all, they didn't have a program. So it was a lot of manually trying to figure that out with very little help from their advisors. And also I just personally, when I visited the schools, I enjoyed WashU's um, program the best, this the way that they explained it to us. Um, but yeah, you can, it's basically applying to college all over again. Um, not as daunting though, because once you hash out a 20 page paper in three days, uh, an application seems like a piece of cake at that point, but um, very similar to the high school and master's application process. I think we, we've settled that one. Evan, do we have another question? Yes. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with a, a story from the class notes section. There are some uh, three, two um, alumni who went to Stanford in probably the 60s or 70s uh, who wrote that uh, a part of the reason why they chose CMC was because of the three, two experience and kind of that, that, that pipeline to Stanford engineering. Um, but when they started and they went to the sessions, they saw there were 60 freshmen thinking about um, the three, two program. And they, they maybe got scared because they think the, the transfer agreement is only maybe, maybe 10 or so. Uh, so I, I say that, and of course, as the years go by, that number dwindled down to sure enough, somewhere around 10 to 12 um, for all the reasons I think we're aware of. The question is how many students now typically start in this major as a first year and what percentage of those typically transfer to an engineering school to complete the three, two program? Jim, what was your high? What do you, what do you well, remember? Well, uh, because of the with the three, the basic three two was uh, we'd have. I would suggest we had about we'd have about three fourths of the freshmen starting uh, would uh, would apply to engineering school. Uh, but we lost uh, in my era. We lost a number of students to the dark side or pure economics and finance. That was the major. Uh, at CMC, the major fall off, but uh, it was around three quarters over, say, a 10 year average. Yeah, well, I, I'm not even keeping that numbers. I would say it's more like a half of what I've counted. But generally, um, when I do information sessions at the beginning, and I'm looking at anywhere from 25 to 40 students who are starting, uh, I see in the fall. Um, it's a lot of hands on. We, we try to work with every, you know, I try to work with every single student. Um, and provide a philosophy that while you're at CMC, all opportunities should stay open as long as possible. 
And maybe because of that, as I found out, a lot of students are, well, I don't know if you want to call it the dark side, but basically are finding their own direction. So if they find their own direction and it's a combination of econ or econ math or physics and econ and is not necessarily the transfer, but they may do it later, I may mean, still consider that a, a, a success. Um, and then for those who, who do transfer, it is astonishing how successful they are. Every time I go and visit them, um, you know, I, I go and visit uh, Columbia and uh, Wash U and, uh, well, it's very easy to get to USC. I mean, every time I meet the students that are in their fifth year and I say, well, have you decided what you're going to try to do for next year? And they go, oh, I already have a job. I mean, it was just like, oh, okay, well, fine. You know, as opposed to me, I had no idea what I was going to do. So they're very, very successful, those who go through this program. I mean, I think that's sort uh, of settles yeah. that question. Uh, we had a couple comments on uh, Professor Naftalin. Could you maybe uh, someone given us give us an update on on what's happening with Professor Naftalin? Well, you see the bicycles behind there. Okay, that means I should be on that bicycle riding with Professor Naftalin right now. Um, he is still okay. He retired, I think, two years ago. Um, and uh, Jim probably wanted to provide his own news. And he um, is, of course, enamored, continues to be enamored by bicycling, getting outside. Uh, we have done uh, bike tours. I have uh, done a tour with him and uh, one of the biology professors, Professor Coleman, uh, in Sardinia. We spent oh, know, about 10 days bicycling through the island of Sardinia uh, and eating some of the best food I've ever, a lot of us said we actually gained weight on, even though the climbs were just brutal. Uh, so he's doing very, very well, and he is now fully vaccinated, and we're looking forward to an Ojai bicycle trip. Um, he also, he's found that he can now read a lot more um, astronomy uh, papers, and he's actually gotten excited about getting back into that type of research. Uh, and he'll come in. We uh, before the pandemic, we would hold a what's called physics lunch, and uh, he was usually the person who come in and regale us with stories about what's going on in the world of physics uh, and astronomy. Uh, and he, he's a great yeah. storyteller. So that's what he's doing. Great, thank you. Um, does Professor Gould still do an open book, collaborative, 24-hour take-home final that kicks your butt? Okay, the collaborative work word is not true, but I hope that was not the case when you were taking it. With, but yes, it is still 24 hours, all completely open book. If you get your information off the internet, that's great. Um, yes, it 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 is... Um, highly demanding but here's the thing as you remember remember I remember, uh, might have remembered you got to take the exam when you were ready and when you were done you were just done and and that was it on the other hand it allowed you to answer questions which were much more demanding and much more thought provoking than uh, you know here's a problem that has three unknowns i'll give you two and you give me the third or something like that um Theoretical mechanics. I just saw a question about theoretical mechanics. Yes, we still offer what's called uh, classical mechanics. It was funny. It's called theoretical mechanics. Is when I first came here, it actually had a laboratory component, which made no sense to me for a theoretical course called theoretical mechanics. Um, and it's still classical mechanics. And it's probably one of the harder uh, upper division physics courses. We now also teach quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, biophysics is very popular. Um, what else? Uh, electricity and magnetism. Uh, so students can and actually we also offer an electronics lab. So students can basically, if they do don't want to be a physics major, they can try a bunch of other upper division physics do the electronics lab and see whether they actually want to get into electrical engineering or not. Both, uh, uh, Professor, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, that's fine. There's some amusing comments in the chat I'm just looking at. <laughs> um, I'll save the chat for you and send it over to you. Um, uh, to both Professor Sagan and Professor Gould, what resources do you wish you had that you don't have right now to, to make sure all of our three twos are, are successful? Scott, Jim, I'll let you start. Yeah, uh, probably time. Some people, a number of students, a good third of the students require quite a bit of detailed advising and the number of students applying to say electrical engineering across the country had very distinct uh, prereqs at the other schools and they needed quite a, 
a bit of advice. Does this course they took here match that course? And so it, if you had a rather large group, it really ate your time up. It would be nice to have more time or uh, associates that were very technically uh, literate. That's how I saw it in a couple of years ago. Yeah, and in my own experiences, I would say exactly that's it. Um, I sort of, so I have moved to, on, of course, online uh, office meetings, but more than that, even before I did that, um, in order to have a personal conversation with me, you have to uh, go to my booking system and book an appointment. And I generally do about 300 appointments a year. So in the, and then most, of course, those time are going to be between the eight months that we're actually on campus. So I'm easily doing two, three personal meetings uh, every every work day. Um, and so it's more of more time uh, is, is probably the biggest issue. Um, and yeah, but then time means personnel and personnel needs money and that's probably where things are going. So uh, a question for uh, certainly our alumni on the panel, but also maybe for those who haven't spoken yet. Um, we had a question that would, would like uh, our alumni to address the opportunities that they feel have been availed to them as a result of completing the 3-2 program. So what is something that, that came to fruition because you were a 3-2 that maybe wouldn't have happened uh, otherwise? Why don't you organize this question and get somebody else to answer these? <laughs> Mr. Baker, Wait, I believe you won. I mean, you want alumni to pop up and sure. say, you know, how did ME affect us? So, you know, uh, getting the degree from the engineering school got you into that technical company or something like that. But what I noticed um, as a new college graduate with other people coming directly from engineering programs at other schools is that it allowed me to grasp what the company or group was trying to do at a higher level that kind of like bumped me up as far as immediately becoming a tech lead in like one year versus an individual contributor. And, you know, I would put that on the management part of the ME degree. Sure, the engineering degree got me into the semiconductor company but the management degree got me the basis for understanding what the higher ups wanted. It got me into the tech lead position, probably like three years ahead of most other new college graduates. And from there, you know, you have that constant battle of, do I stay an individual contributor to tech or do I go, you know, more into management of tech? And, you know, that's a individual choice you'll have to sort out for yourself. But I mean, that's what the management part of the ME did for me. Anybody else want to chime in? I see Brian, Brian Putt from the from the early seventies. I know I see Billy Martin. Okay, well, I, I was I was at I, mean, I, was, I was actually writing the response here because I'll tell you the biggest problem you have is being able to communicate with management, and you need to know how to do that graphically. And oftentimes, and, the, and, and, and be able to convey your insights in a concise way. And oftentimes, engineers uh, are geeks or whatever, and they go into too much detail, and they just don't know how to communicate to, to management. So I think the, the economic side of it uh, and the engineering side is a really good combination. Thanks, Brian. Mark Elson, raise his hand. Mark, you want to unmute? Yeah, I, I'd say the biggest thing that made a difference was being able to write. I mean, most of the engineers can't write a coherent sentence to save their lives. And so when the attorneys, the, the accountants, anybody on the business side needed to talk to a, a technical person, I tended to get called to interpret because I could take the technical substance and express it in a way that made sense to the, the business people. Great, great points. Anybody else wanna? 
Yeah, Evan, this yeah. is Jack Mulder. He's so there. a couple of years out of school after spending some time building PowerPoint presentations in a strategic planning group for a small semiconductor firm, I returned back to my hometown of Tillamook, Oregon and joined uh, Tillamook Cheese. And uh, I, uh, you know, that interpreter or translator role was very important in the early years, being able to speak the language of the various different engineering disciplines, the business side, the legal side, and kind of bring all that together because they'd be speaking in their jargon, speaking past each other. And I could have a conversation with all of them and then help them understand each other. Um, and uh, that served me well, very well now. I've, I've been here for 22 years. Thanks, Jack. And most importantly, thanks for all that you do. We are grateful for all the cheese, all the ice cream, and so on. And so forth. <laughs> Peter from New York. Hi, um, I guess I really wanted to just sort of expand a little bit on the communication issue. It wasn't really so much immediately right out of school, although that was a huge benefit for me. Um, I could go to a company like 3M and be their you know, new East Coast MBA that they were all sort of nervous about and speak engineer to the people and they got it. They sort of understood me, but later on um, after my stint in opera, um, when I went back and was doing computer things, it turned out to be the same kind of thing levels up. And people asked me all the time what I had done or who had advised me or how I'd chosen to do the different educational and work experience things that I'd done that set me up to have a CXO kind of job as I was a CTO, a CIO, a CAO in a bunch of different companies. And it was all really about that. You know, I mean, I spent some time at a big four consulting company where for six months, I literally did nothing but fly down to someplace in Tennessee and translate from the marketing people to the engineering people and back and they didn't want me to go when it was done. And I kind of felt like I was taking their money because I mean, all I was doing was translating, but it made a huge difference there. And further along, you know, the further you go, the more important it gets to be. And I heard several of the other things, you know, legal, HR, all the other kinds of perspectives that you need when you get up at a, you know, to a certain level, particularly in smaller companies where you wear, you know, multiple hats and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely, just you know, communication, writing. Uh, well, just, that's all communication and um, perspective. Thanks, Peter. Hey, Evan, how's it going? Nice to see yeah, you. Good to see you too. Long time. And and Dr. Higden, so yes, great to see you. Me. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Um, and I brought Mike Carp on. I know, that, or I think he's on there somewhere. Where's Mike? Yes. And Mike's here. Did the uh, three two with me? Um, I would just say I think doing the three two program, um, at Claremont, their education was definitely underrated. Um, critical thinking, uh, the broader education. I think I loved my government classes there. Some of the most. Um, and just amazing professors. And then I would just say, yeah, um, having that um, ability to communicate and having um, just yeah, the broad education helps a lot. And then I, I, the question was brought up earlier, why didn't some people go to MUD? It was obviously because there's crazy tests on mega. Yeah, we see all. <laughs> I played water polo when I was at uh, Claremont and uh, I had a buddy I remember that was literally in the weight room, like studying for his test. So, you know, uh, it was just, mud was just the next level. And I ended up going to Columbia and it was a great experience. So uh, just want to say hi to everybody. Perfect. Thanks, Billy. Uh, Harriet Nebhardt, are you with us? I know you sent me a message in the chat. Do you want to go next? But I'm not sure if you're able to unmute or not. Uh, if not, we have just a couple minutes left. Did so you I think... call me? Hi. Evan? Yes, Harry. Okay. Hi. Okay, great. Yeah, I had to switch microphones. It's such a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. I'm Harriet Nemhard. Maiden name was Black. 
My, uh, I graduated from Claremont in 91 and then went on to do master's and PhD at the University of Michigan. I've had a career in academia now for 26 years, have been working and back in touch with Claremont various points throughout that, and currently now serving as an alumna trustee uh, on the board. And from, from the perspective of the question asked of, you know, what, what impact did the management part have for me? I, I agree with all of my colleagues who stress the ability to communicate, to write, to convince, all very important. But I think the thing that it has meant for me, uh, particularly over the decades, that's even deeper than that is, is the confidence to know that uh, as a lifelong learner, uh, learner, I can go back, right, and and study again organizational psychology as I need to, or or economics. You know, now I'm faced with all of these budgetary decisions as a dean, and and you know, I'm just unafraid to jump in at the level of the scholarship or of the text and think again about you know what is the macroeconomic perspective of our College of Engineering, and think about you know uh, the entrepreneurial aspects of advancing the college. And I think all of that is from the confidence of the Claremont experience. Thank you, Harriet. And thank you for your service to the Alumni Association and the Board of Trustees. Um, you, are, you are Dean of the School of Engineering at Iowa, is that correct? That is correct. Yes, so. I've been in the position now for 10 months, but I understand that if you if you take a deanship during a pandemic, you can just add 100 years to the total. So I've been here for 100 years and 10 months. <laughs> Fantastic. Good to see you. So I know it's, it's five o'clock and I know we have some hand, hands raised and uh, we're actually going to pivot back to Professor Gould to give us a very brief overview on kind of the future of science and the 3-2 program at CMC. We will have other programs about that. Uh, over the course of the year ahead. Uh, and then when we're done with that, we'll, we'll close. But those that have raised their hand and want to want to continue chatting, we'll, we'll leave it open. We'll let that happen. So Josh and Gordon, JP, uh, you'll have an opportunity. So Professor Gould, I'll send it back to you to kind of help us wrap up. Sure. So the last time I went and uh, spoke at uh, Columbia or so to the alumni group in New York City, uh, the question of the new CMC science program, what does it mean how would it affect the 3-2 program, et cetera? And in my experience in talking to admissions people, and Harriet, I hope you can confirm what I have been hearing, is that if the CMC does start a science program for which is highly interdisciplinary, if anything, it will enhance the opportunities and enhance the application of any CMC student who might be applying to engineering school. We already have seen this when we used to run what was a program called ACE, which was an integrated science sequence, intro physics, intro biology, intro chemistry, all first year students, very non-traditional. The question is, would med schools accept it? Not only did med schools accept it, but their students were more likely to get invitations to the top schools. I have been to numerous students who graduated from Stanford Medical School because they would had a different experience. And this is the type this integration of sciences and particularly the hope of and adding that and the computer just would make whatever um, application a CMC student who might want to do the three two to transfer shouldn't be a problem. Harriet, I will ask you, as a dean, can you speak on to that? Would you accept a student who went through a much more interdisciplinary program rather than the straightforward courses that we normally list in checkoff boxes? You know, absolutely. And this is really the direction in which we all need to be going as, as colleges of engineering. How do we uh, ourselves create more interdisciplinarity uh, in our curriculum and in the in the co-curricular opportunities, and certainly a student who would have this kind of preparation and um, be able to add that experience to our community, I think, would be easily welcomed with with open arms. Evan, so you're muted, Evan. Oh, I should know how to unmute myself by now. I've done enough of these. Um, well, more to come on the future of science at CMC. Um, the, the college has 
um, declared an intent to leave the joint Keck science program, uh, but not officially filed that. And it's a three-year process once that's filed. So we are looking long-term, but one of the, uh, the pillars of the CMC strategy is to have a fully interdisciplinary science program at CNC, fully available for cross-registration with the other colleges. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that at another time, but it just came time to where three schools needed three different things out of a science program. Um, and uh, we are still very, of course, very collegial. We still are very supportive of Keck Science and our Keck uh, colleagues. So we're still a part of the family and we look forward to really growing that relationship in the near future. So all of you again, thank you for uh, joining us for the hour today. Those of you that wanna stay on and say hello, say goodbye, share any uh, additional tidbits of information, feel free to do so. Otherwise we hope to see you all at future programs whether it be the Athenaeum, the Institutes, or our CMC Connects virtual programming that are occurring each week. Thanks to Professors Higdon and Gould. We hope to see all of you again soon. Good night, everyone. And Professor Gould indicated he will stay out a little bit longer if there's any other questions. Perfect. So I don't know, Josh, you had your hand raised. JP, you had your hand raised. I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything. I will stop recording since the program is. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on uh...